Hi, this is Steve Giddings. For the last few years, we've been trying to develop traps to catch lionfish to help deal with the problem with this invasive species. And in this video, I'll show you a one-sixth scale model of the most recent version of the lionfish trap that we've uh, developed. And following that, I'll show you the dimensions on a, a, a diagram of a full-size trap, as well as some video from underwater of tests being conducted in the Cayman Islands with a full-size trap to show you how it operates. This is a one-sixth scale lionfish trap. I call it a purse trap. It's one-sixth the normal size of a trap. Most of the ones we test in the ocean are six feet across. This is one feet, foot across. And uh, the critical elements here are the fact that this is a non-containment trap. It lays flat on the bottom so it doesn't catch any fish until the trap itself is pulled and then the net closes around whatever fish happen to be within the perimeter of the trap. This plastic sheet in the middle, this we use lattice work, plastic lattice uh, in the real traps and it, um, it attracts lionfish quite well. Lionfish are strongly attracted to structure more so than most other fish. So you get mostly lionfish around these traps. You don't use any bait, so that doesn't attract a lot of species that you would normally get around other traps. Um, and it just, the net lays on the bottom. The fish hover and hang out around the, the fad. And then when it's closed, the, uh, the net is very loosely attached to this frame. And as the jaws of the frame close, the net billows around the fish and the net or the uh, jaws close completely before the netting ever touches the fish. So that's why the fish aren't startled and why they're caught by the trap. The trap has two extensions on the bottom of each jaw, on the bottom, one on each jaw, that we call deflectors. And those things cause the net to open when it hits the bottom by forcing the jaws apart and the uh, laying the net flat on the bottom. There's a harness attached to the trap, uh, one line to each apex of the jaws, um, and they pass through a central loop that would normally be a stainless steel ring, about two inches in diameter, uh, and the harness passes through that so that when you close the trap by pulling the surface line, uh, the jaws are forced closed by the uh, fact that the line passes through that loop. So that loop's very important to keeping the net closed on the way up. So when it hits the bottom, the jaws are forced apart by the deflectors. It lays on the bottom. This float that sits on the uh, harness, above the harness, keeps all the line away from the trap, keeps it from getting tangled but it also gives it some buoyancy and some drag on the way down so that when the trap's descending, it descends vertically, which is important because if this trap gets off kilter and heads down at a tilted uh, orientation, it's possible that it opens or it lays on the bottom without opening. So it's important to keep it vertical on the way down. That means having some drag on the, down, on the line above the trap or maybe some more weight at the bottom of the trap. But in this case, I just have a, a simulated float attached here. This is a close-up of the hinge point uh, on each jaw. And you can see that this jaw comes down and just forms a loop at the end, a little circle loop at the end. And then the other jaw comes down and not only creates a full loop, but continues on to become the deflector, this curved piece here. The axle itself has a loop at the end to stop it from passing through, and so it can uh, be held in place and hold the two jaws together. Both these jaws are identically bent, uh, but then they're turned around against each other so that the deflectors end up on opposite sides. And then the white, as I said before, represents epoxy that you would want to put on any severe bend points because that tends to weaken the steel and create micro fractures in the steel that you would hope would fill with that epoxy and stop salt water from getting into the crack. 
And this is a closer view of the loop that forces the jaws closed when the harness is pulled and the net is pulled off the bottom. You can see that that loop sits slightly above the apex of the net of the trap when it's closed. And it's tied to a line that passes down along the side of the fad and is tied at the axle. So it keeps that in place and it keeps the um, fad vertical most of the time when it's on the bottom. But most importantly, the loop serves as a guide to make sure that trap stays closed once it's pulled off the bottom. You don't want it flapping open and closed because fish will get out. So that loop stops that from happening. You might also notice that anywhere I have a knot on this trap, I've tried to minimize the size of it because the larger they are, the more chance it is that something will snag on, uh, on the knot itself. So for example, on the harness line, I just use a clove hitch and some lashing wrapped around the line to hold it in place. And, um, and elsewhere, anywhere there's a knot, for example, on this chafing guard, I've tried to reduce the size of the knot at the end of each one where it's tied back to the jaw itself. This version of the trap has all the same features with the exception that two additional pieces of lattice were added to it underneath the trap to act as a protective barrier for turtles that might crawl under the trap uh, to rest. We don't know how big a problem that is, but we know it can be a problem. And we don't want turtles crawling under these traps when they're on the bottom and then getting caught in the netting underneath. So one untested yet um, technique that we're using to protect turtles is to add these two flaps that would act as a ceiling underneath the trap when it hits the bottom. They're, loose, they're loosely attached to the axle only. And then when the trap is dropped through the water and hits the bottom and opens up, the frame would lay on top of these two pads. Um, and any turtle that got underneath the trap would have a ceiling above its head or above its shell so that it would be prevented from getting up into the netting itself. So the trap would sit on the flap. And then when the trap is pulled off the bottom, because the trap is only attached at the axle to the pad, the net would still be allowed to billow around the fish as it closes. And then leaving behind, dragging below the trap would be these two pads. So you'd pull the trap up through the water with the pads dragging behind the trap. This diagram shows the measurements of the sides and the angles that we use on a full-size trap, as well as the inserted image showing the nature of the hinges. You can see the tight loops bent into that number four rebar, that's half inch rebar. And the inside diameter of those loops is about an inch and a half or so. The outside diameter, probably two and a half inches. This video sequence shows a slightly older version of the trap in the field being tested. Uh, being dropped off a boat, descending at about a meter per second, hitting the bottom and opening on, on the bottom. Uh, you can see how the deflectors force the jaws apart so that the net splays across the bottom. And finally, watch how the net billows because it's loosely attached to the frame and how the harness draws the jaws tightly closed through the stainless steel loop and keeps them closed during ascent.